We're really delighted to welcome the Otolith Group to Fabrica with their new work, I See Infinite Distance Between Any Point and Another. This new piece, which centres on Etel Adnan, a Lebanese-American poet, and her new, relatively new poem, The Sea, really captures the essence of Fabrica as a com contemplative space. This new work, at its simplest, is a kind of study of Etel Adnan reading one of her latest, latest poems, which is called Sea, which is a 58-page poem that she published in 2011, which is a kind of um, a meditation on a kind of materialist, it's a kind of materialist reading of the sea. She's an 87-year-old poet based in Paris, who lived for many years in the United States, and who's taught philosophy, and has taught literature. And I'd say she's one of the most important living poets. So Jean-Luc Godard said one of the most important things and one of the most difficult things a film can do is show somebody reading. How do you show somebody reading? It's a question. Um, Hollywood tends to avoid it. It's supposed to be boring. So um, the challenge here is to show a poet reading her work. And um, this is the challenge of the poem and the challenge of the film is when cinema encounters poetry how does cinema envision a poetic encounter and uh, the challenge is to stay with the poem not to cut away to poetic images of the sea or poetic images of the sky or the countryside not to illustrate the poem but to stay with the the concentration in other words to concentrate on the gestures and expressions of concentration that the poet herself brings to the work. So in this sense, the film is a study in constraint. There's a, a dialectic relation between the concentration, constraint, and limits of the film, and the kind of imaginative unfolding that is implied by the film. In other words, in order to show something unfolding and opening, you have to go via an image of closure and concentration. And this is what we try to achieve. The second element of our spring exhibition um, is a new work by Invisible Flock called Sea of Voices. Um, they've been working really closely with um, local arts organisation Blast Theory, who are part of the commissioning partnership and who've been uh, providing residency facilities and also uh, providing an opportunity for Invisible Flock to just draw on their vast experience of making technologically focused um, work in really complex public spaces. Is that who your message is for? Perhaps you've already decided on your message. Like Josh Henley back in Fat Face, you're quick to scribble down the words, or perhaps like Buzz Aldrin, you're not. You might be by the telescope now, and if you are, look through it. Once you're ready to move on, set your course for birds, for the two swallows hovering over a dead soul, in this case, a fish. The walk is, uh, it's sort of like a, a big shaggy dog story in some ways uh, of an idea which is uh, a personal journey that's about our relationship to the sea, our relationship to where we are at this moment in time, uh, and it's about distances. It's about um, the scale of everything, and the scale of ambition, uh, the scale of the physical journey you're on, but um, also along a sort of a whole load of different scales. We, we bring in ideas of Captain Cook and his voyage to Tahiti, which then led to him going to discovering New Zealand, Australia. We look at the distance of travelling to the moon and Buzz Aldrin, and we look at our own personal distances that we travel along our lifetime. We got three old sea telescopes, uh, that actually what, at least one of which used to appear along this front, but, but then was taken out. And we, we, we found a, a, a guy in Winchester who does reclaimed telescopes and we got them and we didn't do anything to them in terms of pretting them up. We left them in their, their, in, in their original state and then we hacked them. And by that, I mean, we actually took apart their innards and put in our own, uh, our own technology. We'd always been playing around with the idea of messages and communications and um, the journey is it simply senses is you taking, accompanying a message 
from the beginning of your journey to the end and you send that uh, message out in the last instance by texting uh, a nautical buoy which we've got which is just in the marina behind us uh, which is has a huge traditional beacon light on it and when you text the buoy it turns your light into transfers it into morse code and then blinks it out to sea at night Let's walk past the pier to our right and further past the big wheel and carry on in a straight line. Another list. This one's a practical list. Knots. Nautical miles. Electronic gyroscopes. Paper charts. Pencil marks. Currents. Depth of water. The sun and the stars. Radio direction, finding, dead, reckoning, ship's log, sextant, chronometer, star location predictors, compass bearings, Norris tables, a lead weight, radar, foghorns, buoys, lighthouses, beacons, SOS, CQB. We did want it to create an emotional journey. We wanted that if you are, if we are expecting you to go for an hour and 20 minute stroll, that we want, we, we want there to be some meaning behind it. And, but... We want that to be, I suppose, meaning brought from you rather than us telling you what to think. So along the way, we, we give you ideas about what a message would be and the emotions of it, but we, we try and leave that up to you. And um, the response actually has been overwhelming. And we've, uh, it, it's really interesting to see how people have emotionally connected to the work and that when you're left at the end here by yourself, that it really does, it appears that it gives people a real, a real moment to think about everything that's gone before, but also their own place in this in this moment in time, and and that has been cross generational as well. It's been from 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 very young people going on it to actually people in the, the later stages of their life who are still connecting emotionally with the idea of where you are in this moment of time and what your mark what mark you've made on on your time on this planet as well. The third element of our spring exhibition is an artist residency. Um, we're working with Brighton-based poet Maria Yaschenska. Maria is a, a, a person who came to England as a child. She was originally born in Warsaw in Poland. And uh, borders, um, whether they're kind of psychological or internal borders, as well as very literal borders, national borders, um, have been a part of her work and a concern for her personally for all the way through her life. The, the residency programme that Maria is a part of is something that we've been um, developing over a number of years. It's where we um, ask an artist to work with the, the theme of the exhibition um, and respond to it in a way that's appropriate to their practice. Um, there's no requirement to produ produce a piece of work. All we ask is that the artist share their thoughts and um, their interactions with the audience. I'm going to be exploring some questions about borders, crossing borders, crossing the seas that any of us need to cross to get where we want to be, how we change in that process, what we lose, what we gain. I'm going to be exploring those kinds of questions. I'm a poet and I'm also a communicator. I like to engage with people, I like to talk to people. and. I'm going to set up a conversation uh, whereby I'm going to ask members of the public, anybody, everyone, yourself included, to respond to three questions. And I'm not looking necessarily for literal answers, although they could be. Uh, they can, you can respond as freely as you want. You can respond as poetically or not as you want. And the three questions I've chosen are, where do you come from? What's the purpose of your visit? And do you have anything to declare? If you're in the gallery right now, then you can respond here and now, and the volunteers will show you how to do that, and that would be great. If you're wanting to um, respond later, or if you're seeing this on the website, you can respond by going on Fabrica's website, going on my blog, uh, and responding that way.
I don't really know what I expected. Certainly in terms of the answers that I got, there's an, incre there's an incredible diversity. Uh, one of the issues that comes through is that some people clearly feel they come from somewhere. Other people uh, didn't feel comfortable with that and felt they didn't really belong in one particular place. So there's a lot in the answers about their own journeys and, and their own stories and you know the borders that they've crossed. Uh, and some end up feeling that they do belong somewhere, whereas others have clearly said, I don't feel I belong anywhere. Uh, and some enjoy being in different cultures or different places, whereas others find that difficult or painful. Where do you come from? My mother, another climate, the Southern Hemisphere, where the Indian and Atlantic oceans meet, the rainbow nations where the crickets sing night and day. What's the purpose of your visit? To escape, to discover, to grow old, to feel safe, to be free, to become a lesbian, a mother, an artist. Do you have anything to declare? Unprocessed baggage, a deficient racist education, an abusive father, an alcoholic mother, the apartheid regime. I've had an um, incredible response to the questions. Uh, it's been fantastic. Some people have been funny, people have said sad things, people have said very revealing things, very honest things, very lyrical, poetic things. I mean, a whole, whole range of answers. Then we've got a really short one. Where'd you come from the 1970s? What's the purpose of your visit? To have a sit down. Do you have anything to declare? I don't know anything. The first question was, where'd you come from? And people responded literally and not literally. So, you know, on these cards, there are responses from Boston, Sheffield, China, Hungary, Somerset, Finland, India. But there's also responses like planet Earth, my mother, my mother's womb, women dreams water, the land of diversity, colour, food, and the perpetual rat race. The responses to what do you have to declare question, I think have in a way been the most provocative. Uh, some have been very throwaway, no, I haven't got anything to declare. Some of people have said, I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, there's one here that says, I don't know, and it just repeats for all three questions. It says, I don't know, I don't know, exclamation mark. I don't know where I come from or the purpose of my visit. Uh, other people have uh, declared some really poignant things, actually. Uh, one person's put, I got my heart broken last night. Uh, someone's declared an old camera. Someone's put that they've eaten three bags of hula hoops this week. Lots of people have put, this is me, just myself. Um, more heartfelt ones. I'm trying, I'm really trying. I just need someone to give me a break. For myself, I feel like I've just gone deeper and deeper into this, this whole subject, which is so essential to me. Uh, through reading the answers, through my own reading, through responding to the film essay about Etel Adnan. Then another one, my parents were Polish. I was brought up in the Midlands. I have worked and lived in Scotland for more than four years. I'm a European living in Glasgow. What's the purpose of your visit? Visiting friends and taking in a bit of the festival. Do you have anything to declare? I've had a good life, if only I'd realised it sooner. The starting point for this exhibition and the, the, the two um, major commissions um, uh, is, was a project called The Boat Project by Lone Twin. Um, the Boat Project is one of 12 major commissions that are happening across the UK to celebrate um, London 2012, um, the Cultural Olympiad. About 11 years ago now, we started to talk to each other about this idea that we'd build a boat and that in doing that we'd sort of engage uh, people in some way. We, we, we'd done a lot of projects where we were looking at how um, how sort of the world's human geography is, is decided upon by water. You know, that well, we're here in Brighton today, and Brighton's here because the sea's here, but all cities grow up around rivers. The only ex ex exceptions to that are the Vatican and Las Vegas. 
Um, and water gives us, you know, gives us a land to human geography. Where we are is because, because of water. And we, we'd made all of these projects that somehow sort of looked at those sorts of things. Then we started thinking about boats, how boats had opened up the world and had introduced us to, to sort of, you know, we thought we were alone on the world until there were boats and we could go somewhere else and meet other people. And we saw boats, we started to think of boats as a sort of, the idea of a boat being a, being a sort of catalyst for making other things happen. For the last year in Emsworth, which is sort of westward, about, a mile, about an hour away, we've been building this boat and we've been building it from um, pieces of wood that members of the public have brought to us, have donated to us, have gifted to the project. And we put a call out, we asked for, the, we asked for this wood, and we, asked, um, we, we, we said we would take anything, but it would need to have one stipulation, which was which would, that it would have a story uh, behind it somehow. It would be, be something that had lived with you, um, perhaps not for a very long time, although some of these items have been in people's families for years and years and years, but it would be a part of your life in some way and that you would come, you'd give us the, the item, you'd also sort of tell us the story. We'd collect both things, we'd record the, um, the story by sort of interview. We'd take the object, and from those objects we would build this boat, which is a sort of 30-foot state-of-the-art yacht, a sort of quite incredibly beautiful um, modern uh, sports boat. And the idea is that when the boat's finished that it becomes uh, the sort of people's boat. And it be, we, hopefully it becomes a public resource, like a library or a park that's there to use. We set up a trust, a charitable trust, that sort of creates a sort of annual programme of events around the boat. Because the boat will live for many, many years, you know, sort of outlive all of the people that sort of built it, donated to it. It sort of has this life beyond us. So we set up this trust that um, gives access to the boat, you know, for the rest of its life to the public. And that will happen in two ways. One is for sailing, so for, you know, for boat stuff. And the other is as, as an art sort of space venue and sort of um, an, an object. This sort of incredible sort of archive of the region, of the country, of lives. It has sort of things of national importance in it, sort of personal importance. And they all end up in a book and that book lives on the boat. So the boat's there as a sort of archive for you know, people that want to use it in that way, for artists that might want to engage, engage with it in that way, but also sort of writers and, you know, all sorts of folks. So, yeah, hopefully it becomes quite a sort of useful and unique public resource.